Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody in the room. Good evening, everybody uh, on the live stream. Welcome to the first lecture in the 2021-22 uh, Stad Salons Urbain lecture series. And the title of this year is Cities for People, Not for Profit. From Private Ownership to Communal Stewardship. Now, I'm David, David Bossens. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Cosmopolis Center for Urban Research. And I'm very proud that we can actually organize this series. We had planned to do so last year, but you know what happened. I mean, we chose to postpone it and to organize it in real life. And I think we'll have the benefit of that. Uh, but of course, we also wanted to go hybrid to allow uh, a wider audience to join in. Now, I'm a uh, lecturer at Cosmopolis, uh, and we've been organizing this together with uh, Brussels Academy and Brussels Center for Urban Studies. Uh, and I want to give special thanks to people from uh, Brussels Center for Urban Studies, Lena, uh, but also people from Brussels Academy, Marion and Snow, for doing all the hard work in organizing this. And I also want to thank my colleagues at Cosmopolis, Bas van Heur, um, uh, Line Algoed and Nila Arnouts uh, for joining me in, in uh, setting up this program. So thanks a lot for that. Now, about, uh, about the series, uh, you may have heard earlier this week uh, what happened in Berlin. It has been on Flemish news and I think also international news. Something happened, uh, something quite extraordinary happened in Berlin. There was a referendum, a non-binding referendum uh, was held and uh, it dealt with the question what should be done with large property owners, because there's a an, an, an tremendous trend of large property developers owning more and more uh, housing in this, uh, in this global city of Berlin. Um, and it's, it's taking place in a context of huge affordability issues. An increasing share of the population doesn't have access to affordable housing. And the referendum said, okay, what should we do with that? Do you think we should uh, expropriate these, um, these large property uh, developers and holders. Okay? Uh, and the result was a yes. It was a bit of a marginal yes, but still it was a clear signal, signal that something had to happen uh, regarding uh, the current dominance of private large-scale ownership of housing. And when you look at the city of Brussels, it strikes very f as very familiar, because also Brussels is confronted with a, the with a housing crisis as a housing uh, 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 supply crisis, but also a mismatch in terms of what kind of housing is being offered um, and what you could say the local residents actually want. Uh, and there's also the increased involvement of property developments, uh, property developers often in speculative ways and institutional investors, large scale investors uh, buying into properties and cities. So the question that we want to ask with this series is who actually owns the city? A city like Brussels, but, in, uh, but also other cities who benefits from this urban ownership. And uh, how can we think ownership in a different way? Uh, what are the imaginable alternatives and what are the emergent alternatives to private ownership? Could it be about the commons? Could it be about, um, about stewardship? Other kinds of values of governing uh, urban space and infrastructure, housing. Uh, these kind of questions we want to discuss in the next one year and we have eight great speakers uh, to do so. So the entire series runs until uh, May and the full program uh, is available uh, on the website of Brussels Academy and Brussels Center for Urban Studies. So and today we start the lecture series with a uh, presentation by Professor Tine de Moor. She's a professor of social enterprise and institutions for collective action at the Rotterdam School of Management in the Netherlands, uh, and this is part of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Now, in her talk, Professor de Moor uh, will offer a historically informed perspective on urban ownership, and she has been doing tremendous amounts of work on uh, the creation, functioning, and evolution of institutions for collective action, past and present, from the early modern period in Europe until today. So she really has a historical perspective, a long-term perspective, on collective action, on process of commoning, etc. And what she will do today is draw on this historical background to start translating, you could say, uh, insights on the commons that typically have a rural or origin, 
to urban context. So what does commoning and collective action uh, regarding ownership uh, mean in an urban setting? How can you organize that? What are the pitfalls of that? How can this be an inclusive process? And also how as a commoner or as a citizen that wants to go for collective ownership, yeah, how are you confronted with systemic pressures in land markets, uh, uh, political pressures, um, the power of the market and of uh, local uh, governance institutions. So this is a bit the theme uh, that will be discussed today. And uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Dumour, I would like to give you the floor. There's about an hour of lecture and then there's plenty of time for Q&A. So please note down your questions. Thank you. Thank you, David, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation. I think the invitation by now is about two years old. Um, so it has been riping over the years. And I hope this will also have a positive influence on the talk I'm about to give, which is exactly indeed what, by and large, what David um, just described. Um, but given that we are here in a sort of academic environment, I've seen this also a bit of a, as a well, a, a lecture to students, uh, not just the general public lecture you would give. And um, by giving this lecture, I would also like to ask you to think along with me and basically with society at large about these big challenges that just have been described. And I would like to end with a sort of last slide with um, food for thought. And I hope that food for thought about a value-based economy can then be picked up in the questions afterwards. But do note down your questions, and I, I do hope we can spend lots of time on answering those questions, or at least discussing this. But let's start in a very, very basic way. So if you ever have typed in cities in Google, I just did it for fun, and what do you see wh wh when you get that? I was really surprised when I saw this picture popping up. The only images you get to see are of buildings, of infrastructure. And there is absolutely not a single person to be seen on what Google shows you. I was totally shocked by this because when what we're going to discuss about today is actually, I think, about the fundamental construct of the city, which is composed by the social infrastructure, by people, uh, essentially. And it is also the starting point for uh, the social innovations, I think, that can take place within the cities. And I think cities have a, a huge role to play in that. But luckily there was one picture when I scrolled down that gave me a far better image, and that was the picture of a puzzle for six to eight years old. So apparently that age is susceptible for the real picture of a city, and that's a, a picture of what a city really is. It's a very condensed place, very, um, very crowded place in a way by both people, many people, but also services, and many services are shown on this wonderful picture from mobility, playgrounds, schools, doctors, hospitals, you name it, a city has it. The fact that a city has it is an incredible asset. And the assets, but also the challenges, are, are basically the starting point of what I would like to talk to you about um, in the next more or less hour. And we have to talk about this. We can't not talk about this for the very simple reason that we have huge challenges ahead of us, of us as a humanity, as society, um, and also because the city is only going to become a more important concept in the next decennia. I think you've all chosen a very wise, wise master uh, to work on an urban uh, studies, uh, so your knowledge is going to become only more relevant, I think, in the next uh, decennia. So now, well, a few years ago already, um, there was over half of the world population was living in cities, and it's not going to take that long anymore before um, basically 85% of the population will be living in cities all over the world. So that's a huge challenge. But as I said, it's not just a challenge, it's also an opportunity. In many different ways, we already know these are reports written by colleagues elsewhere in Europe and, and, and the US that show that there's actually many beneficial sides to cities. 
be it in terms of, uh, of for example, uh, lesser emissions because people live closer to each other, so the concentration of people, so it, it, it might be good for the climate if people uh, continue to live in cities, but it also might be interesting, simple for public health, uh, people have closer access to um, health services, but also there's, le there's proof of lesser obesity, for example. So many different reasons why we should think positively of cities, but still there's something very paradoxical about cities. I'm sure you are very much aware of that. On the one hand, it's a very interesting way to live because it's a very compact way to create critical mass for specific services going from education, uh, career opportunities, access to high quality education, emergency services, you name it, a city has it. There's a concentration of wealth and employment opportunities. It's also interesting for markets to develop. Of course, initially, and I'm a historian, so I have to feed you some history, but the, the city was, of course, the growth and the development and the, the name of the city was very closely development to markets, literally markets, market places. Eh? So if you go back to the medieval period, there where you find cities, you also find high concentration of commercialization and market development. And as such, it's also a breeding ground for new ideas, for innovation, for new technologies to be tested, for new concepts to be tried out. And in, in, in many different ways, it's also an easier way to provide people access to services and to provide access also to that innovation. Yeah? I think this is really a very basic thing you must have noticed yourself by living, for example, in Brussels. But on the other hand, the second part of the paradox, of course, a, a city is also a place where you have a lot of resources, but due to the concentration, there's also scarcity of resources, not just because of the people who live in the city, but also, of course, of commuters, tourists, so people who basically only come to the city to, well, sometimes they work here and contribute, but often take from the resources, from the services, but do not necess necessarily also contribute to the resources by, for example, paying taxes. Mm? So that's a, a very big conundrum sometimes for cities, uh, to be a center, but at the same time also survive. At the same time, of course, we also see high levels of poverty sometimes and difficulties to enter the specific labor market where people are actually living in. So uh, again, they're the paradox. And of course, because people live closer together, there's often a more, uh, a more conflictual situation, also in, in terms of community building, social alienation, uh, violence, whatever. It's often the negative tones we hear when we talk about the city. And even though there is a physical closer connection to the, social ser uh, to the services offered in the city, there's often a larger social different, uh, distance to uh, services offered in the city. So it's not because you live close to it that you also have easy access to these uh, services. And the most, well, the, the most visible way to, to see all of these negative sides of the paradox, uh, David also referred to it, is of course the housing problem, as you just described, uh, is also, well, it's, it's a big issue in Berlin, but we had a, a, a big demonstration in Amsterdam a few weeks ago, so it's a very hot debate right now, and it's becoming a hotter debate, of course, also in Belgium more and more. Uh, the pressure on housing, at the same time also on green spaces, and on public spaces in general. In general, for example, through due to tourism, which is, again, um, well, g going up these days in the tourism in, in Europe. There's tourists all over Brussels right now, which is great, but of course it also puts a lot of pressure on the public spaces. And there is pressure on private spaces. Um, the housing problem is, is also in Belgium, eh, for example, in terms of the property that people, uh, or the degree to which people have property in different income levels, it's quite visible that um, it's becoming harder, even with uh, two incomes, for example, to actually buy a house, to become an owner of a house. Um, in Belgium, this has been going down quite uh, seriously over the past few years. So ownership, is not necessarily easy within an urban context. It's becoming more and more difficult to become an owner of a house, in particular in an urban context. Yeah. Of course, because a lot of people also realize the value of a city and are willing, to some extent, to live in the cities. So there's a lot of paradoxes there, a lot of um, 
challenges accompanied with opportunities, a lot of um, solutions accompanied with big problems, problems that are often hard to uh, deal with. I think that's nothing new for you. I think all of these issues must have been uh, well dealt with in your course or maybe will be over the next few months. So we have to think of solutions for this paradox and I think we have to also think very much out of the box, out of the current, basically, um, the current situation is that, that we, we often think either the government has to solve it or the market will solve it. But in practice we see that the government actually is leaving open a lot of opportunities, so to speak, to the market to fill it in, but the market does not always deliver. Or it delivers, but at a high price, at a high cost, inaccessible, um, very exclusive. But sometimes also there's clear examples of market failure. And I will explain and show you some. And I will show you a lot of examples. I will show you some graphs. I will so show you some maps. A lot of them are about the Netherlands. Although I do live in Belgium, um, I, I think I know more about the Netherlands than I know about Belgium sometimes. But uh, <laughs> that has to do, of course, with my academic background um, and the data I will show are also about the Netherlands and in some ways there is differences between Belgium and the Netherlands. I know quite a few of you have not no Dutch nor Belgium background so I will try to open it up a bit but of course um, I don't have data about everything so you will have to bear with me when it comes to that. So solutions to the paradox, thinking a bit out of the box and that this is basically the, the overview more or less of um, what I'm going to talk about for the next three quarters or something like that. Um, basically, I think it's to some extent um, important that we talk about um, the difference, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that are for the room there is between the market and the state in terms of solutions. The institutional diversity, as we know it, is actually very limited. We actually basically have a very limited number of options to solve societal problems right now. The question I would like to address here, is there something in between? Is there something that citizens can do, sometimes with the support or without the support of the market or the state? And what can it look like? And there's a huge variety in between there. Yeah? And it sometimes has to do with public goods provision, and sometimes has to do with private goods provision. I will say a bit more about that later on. And I will then continue talking about what the social innovation that could take place in between market and state could look like. What kind of governance regime could be in between there? And I will give you some examples, some background, some mechanisms, some theory, uh, so that you can actually form yourself an idea. But the best way to actually learn about what is going on right now already between market and state, so to speak, is to well, walk around in Brussels, but also in other places in Europe, and actually learn from the people who are currently experimenting with setting up such institutions. More about that in a moment. And lastly, I would like to end with just food thought, thought about the potential this gives to, a, to build a more value-based economy, a value-based way of dealing with our resources, both the public and the private resources that we hold and that we have to be careful with because scarcity will be well, abundant, so to speak, <laughs> in the future. Okay, um, just a graph. Oh, this is not very, very visible, but it does show three times the map of the Netherlands, I can tell you. And actually, the third time, it's a map of, the, of Europe. It's a picture of two years old, and in the meanwhile, it, it's actually been... Uh, there's only more dots on, this, um, on these maps. Uh, what you see here is a spectrum, so to speak, of various new forms of institutions for collective action. I will be using that term on and off after this, together with citizen collectivities. It's a bit, a bit more general, but the academic term, so to speak, which was coined by Elna Rostrom, and she got the Nobel Prize for her work on that, um, is institutions for collective action. So it's a mouthful, so I will say citizen collectivities once in a while as well. Um, and what you see here is actually um, a spectrum, I call it, between, on the one hand side, types of citizen collectivities, institutes for collective action, which have developed in sectors where they have done so, basically because the market did not offer a good solution. Basically because 
out of misery, I sometimes say, because out of lack of alternatives. And for example, in the Netherlands, you see that motivation um, is very, very clear for many people who set up a care cooperative. By now, there's over, uh, I think, 1,500 what they call care communities across the Netherlands, which provide in a variety of services and goods, from uh, building houses for people who are dementing uh, to uh, organizing weekly soup moments for uh, people who are 80 plus to setting up daycare centers for people with a uh, disability. I could go on forever. A very large package, a very large array of services provided by citizens who decide we've got to provide these services because the government no longer does so and there have been some uh, laws uh, that basically have sort of uh, decentralized these services, but the, the local governments also had to do with l less money, so some services are simply no longer provided. And the idea was that the market would pick up, but in many cases, nothing happened. And from a purely economic perspective, it's, it's perfectly explainable that it didn't happen, because in some regions there is a very low population density, uh, or there's a very low concentration of a specific um, a, a, a kind of a public that you would organize an activity for. So basically the market doesn't see the critical mass, which you might have in cities, by the way, but it doesn't see so in some non-urbanized areas. And you see it, for example, in times of the care cooperatives in the bottom, there in Limburg, North Brabant, are areas where you have, yeah, uh, in, in many cases, low, low population density. So the, the market is not, res not, not interested in going there. So citizens set up their own co care cooperatives. At the other end of the spectrum, you have a development which actually has been going on for a lot much longer time. Um, it's a graph of 2019, but you could easily say this development has ta been taken already 20 years before that. And that's the movement between the so-called community, energy communities, the RESCOPs, the renewable energy communities across the uh, the Europe. And you see a particularly high density there in Germany. And I didn't bring the figures with me, I now realize, but there's a very nice graph which shows that this whole setup of local energy communities, whereby the village runs sometimes just a windmill or a park of solar panels, but sometimes also goes off the grid because they've connected all the energy suppliers, farmers, windmills, whatever, within vi one village and actually went off the grid and became self-sufficient in terms of energy. So it's, it's a really huge variety there too of types, of types of services and resources. But because of this development, Germany really went into the modus of an Energiewende, a, a really energy change, a an, an change towards renewable energy. It has proven basically that even with many small communities, with many small organizations, sometimes just providing energy to the local village of a thousand inhabitants, with all those together, you can make a change. So you don't need, not, not you don't necessarily need one huge energy provider to make that change. It can be stimulated by a lot of small ones. They are at the other end of the spectrum. Why? Because basically, it is possible to get renewable energy through a commercial provider. Yeah, you of course never sure it's really green energy because it's you know it's diva, it's produced somewhere um, and you get it uh, in your house, but you don't really know what kind of energy it really is. But you can actually pay for green energy. So there's no shortage in the market, but there is an opportunity there for citizens to invest in it and sometimes even get financial benefits out of it, to get dividends out of it. So it's even actually financially interesting to invest in energy these days. In many cases, actually in, in all these cases, and when it comes down to renewable energy cooperatives, of course, it's also about having renewable energy fr first and foremost. Yeah? But people are not afraid to invest in it because it's an interesting investment. And in between you have a variety of um, initiatives that either do it because it's um, uh, hard to find, for example, um, uh, organic food, for example, and, and the food cooperatives you see booming massively over the past 10 years, more or less. Um, it's actually a sector that started pretty late with this development, after care and definitely after energy. Um, but you definitely see it growing now in the Netherlands, but also, for example, in Belgium, many new um, uh, 
consumer cooperatives which focus on organic food. Um, not because you can't get it in the supermarket, but because people also want control over where their food comes from, and also because they want to support their local farmer. And in fact, um, this is one of the sectors that has been booming enormously since the beginning of the pandemic. In some areas in Europe, there was a five-fold increase of local uh, food that was um, sold. So it really has also shown people that this is not only about getting resources, and it's about very basic resources, like care, energy, food, etc. It's not about where you get your toothbrush or something like that. It's really about what you really, really need to have a good life, so to speak. Um, it really has shown people also, it's also a bit about control. Where do you get your food? How can I, as a consumer, influence where I get what? This is more or less a spectrum. One of the PhD students in the Netherlands is actually looking at this huge increase which you now see due to this decentralization and outsourcing of care. It's privatization of the care sector in the Netherlands and you see that since 2015 it has grown quite substantially. Um, but we also see it in other sectors. For example, in the insurance sector, um, the old concept of the mutual, which is, for example, in Belgium still very fundamental in the organization of the care system, has been revived in the Netherlands. So in the 19th century, we've seen a huge rise of mutuals, mutual insurances, and it means exactly what, it, uh, what the term says. You insure each other, but within a group. So you put budget together to make sure that in case somebody gets sick, you can actually draw uh, m money from it so you're insured in that period, or you insure, for example, your health uh, costs, etc., with it. Now, in the Netherlands, for example, these all have been, um, well, uh, uh, the, the government, of course, has taken some, over some of these functions over in the welfare state, but uh, a lot of it has, uh, of these in insurance functions, has been taken over by the private sector. However, not so long ago, uh, in 2004, the government decided to no longer uh, support um, the insurance for people who got well, sick, who weren't able to work anymore, but those people who were self-employed, yeah, people who just have their, their own as an employee and nobody else. And that's quite a huge sector, it's quite a huge uh, part of a society, actually. And the, the government also has stimulated quite a lot in the Netherlands. And when we had the economic crisis in 2008, a lot of people were made redundant and they said, okay, then I'll become self-employed. So a huge rise of these self-employed, but no insurance. So if you get sick, there you are, you have a problem. You can go to a market provider, an insurance company, but it's enormously costly. It can cost you hundreds of euros a month. And well, not everyone who's self-employed has that money to spend on this. So a lot of people who are self-employed in the Netherlands are simply not insured at all. Yeah? They have no backup or no plan B whatsoever. So in uh, the beginning of well, 2010, 2011, there was this revival of the concept of the mutual in uh, the form of a bread fund, broodfondsen in Dutch. And it simply refers to having bread on the table when you are sick, when you can't work, to make sure that there's a budget provided by the community you attach yourself to um, in case you get sick. Yeah? And so we, we've seen this enormous growth over the past by now over 10 years of the number of bread fund groups. And those are mutual groups, no longer than 50. So they, they've really restricted to a number so that the social control internally can also make sure that people don't free ride. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. And um, over n by now, we there's over 28,000 self-employed in the Netherlands who have joined a bread fund like that. And what is important to note here too, We'll talk a bit about shared resources, collective resources later on. The bread fund shows very well that it's not just about the money you can get from the collective fund in case you get sick, but it's also about the social benefits you get. In the sense, for example, that you th these are often very locally um, organized. So in a city, you can have five bread funds. And some of them, for example, have a lot of web designers in it. They work for themselves. But imagine you get sick. And you don't want your business to just drop that. Yeah? You want to make sure your business continues. You can actually agree with somebody from your group that they take over a temporary job of yours. The other thing can also take place, that people have too much demand 
and they just share their jobs with others within the bread fund. So it's also a sort of solidarity network when it comes to work. Yeah? And in that sense, they very much are like the guilds, for example, which I'll say a bit more about that later on. Now, this is happening in the Netherlands, but it's also work, uh, happening elsewhere in the world. Um, you see a lot of these forms of new mutuals popping up digitally, um, but they have one big downside being that they don't meet physically. And meeting physically is often the cheapest way to avoid free riding, so to avoid additional costs by free riders. Um, but it is quite notable that over the world, basically, from China to the US, you see new forms of mutualism, sometimes very small, sometimes very large, popping up. But I also want to show you something else, because I often get questions from particularly journalists and city councils, etc., about, yes, okay, but this is all very white and very, very uh, upper class, etc., um, because they see these new initiatives in their cities popping up and they think, oh, well, it's just people who are highly educated who can do this. But if we would open our eyes a bit more, we, should we would see many forms of institution for collective action outside of those very innovative pro-social citizens and who, who are highly educated. They're, by the way, not always that highly educated. There's a huge variety by now. For example, among the bread, bread Fund members, we know that by now a lot of people of different backgrounds have joined. But if we would look around, for example, in Brussels, we would find many interesting things. So if any one of you is looking for an interesting thesis uh, subject, I have a suggestion. Go around and talk to people, for example, from the African community and talk about to them for example, to people from the Congo or Rwanda about tontines. The tontin is a, is a legal term, but it also refers to the um, joint f funding systems they have here. We, we call those roscas, the rotating saving and credit mechanisms. You see those in many um, ethnic communities, for example, in, in, uh, among the Suriname people, the people from Suriname in the Netherlands, they are called kasmonis and literally the money refers to money. Huh? And it's a joint system whereby, for example, often it's often women who then meet once a month and they put in 50 euros in the collective fund. And once in a while, every so many times, you get the collective fund. And what is interesting is that it's actually a fairly costly system to do it that way because you have to pay something to the person who runs the, the ROSCA, the rotating saving system. Um, you, I mean, there's, there's lots of reasons not to do it, purely financially and economically, but there's a lot of social reasons to do it, because it, it builds on the community, people trust each other, whereas if they go to the bank, well, the bank, for, to start with, doesn't always trust them, huh? so that can be hard to get in. Um, but you also won't have somebody knocking on your door if you've missed a payment. Because then you go to the Roska and you say, okay, we need a way to solve this. So there's a social control mechanism that also has solutions. And interestingly enough, there's, for example, now a new initiative, which I show up there, called the SENG, which literally refers to cent, son, eh? uh, so the cent as a payment, uh, me a means of payment in St. Martin in uh, the Caribs, um, which set is setting up this system for people from St. Martin the island, but also from people who live in the Netherlands who want to support people in St. Martin who contribute to this Roska system and to help rebuild the island after the storm of a few years ago. Um, so it, the idea is there. So if you, if you see people setting up these institutes for collective action, um, you know, among young people in the, in the city, also look what happens in other communities because often they have a long tradition in that. But let's go back a bit to the Netherlands and to uh, some more data to show you how we've seen this developing this. And, and I don't show you the graph because um, of the fact that it's going up, this number of institutions for collective action. This is actually a graph of the cooperatives, which is the, an often chosen legal form for this kind of organization. I'm not so, sure, not, not so interested in the fact that it goes up. I think I've already tried to convince you of that. But when does it start? Yeah, and often, um, so just after the economic crisis and, and financial crisis in 2008, 
the journalists picked us up, the media picked us up and started saying, hey, this is a response to the crisis. This is how we have to solve the crisis, or at least the citizens think this duocracy, as they called it, is the solution to the crisis. But if you look at this graph, you see that it actually started already before that time. It's possible that the crisis has a sort of stimulating effect on it, but it actually already took place before that. And if you consider that before you actually set up a legal uh, form, a cooperative, it takes time to build that community. It can take one to two years, maybe even longer, before you actually go to the register and you know register your energy cooperative or your care cooperative. Well, basically, we could easily say that it's around the turn of the century that we've seen a real growth of people choosing this, this idea. And why they do so, I will exp try to explain you in a moment. We've actually seen a similar development in, in, in Belgium. This is a graph for the Dutch-speaking part, but it's later. There it is around the economic crisis. I don't think it has to do with the economic crisis, but with some other factors. For example, in Belgium, we see far lesser care cooperatives Actually, very few uh, of these care cooperatives have popped up. And there is a very good reason for that. In Belgium, the care has not been privatized as much as in the Netherlands. Uh, there's still a very strong mutualist uh, organization. Uh, anybody who's uh, insured in Belgium will have to join one of these mutuals. Well, there's also a sort of neutral option, but usually you choose either to go to the socialist or to the Christians or to the liberals. Um, so the, the pillarization is actually quite strong still. Um, in many ways, that's a disadvantage in keeping up or, or becoming a, being a bay against privatization. It's actually sort of an advantage, you could say. But if we go a bit more local, we also see for, uh, just a few examples here in, in Brussels. Very interesting examples. Um, I haven't talked a lot about uh, uh, food and, and, and um, uh, well, supermarkets in this case, but there's a nice example of the B Scoop uh, cooperative supermarket uh, here in Brussels. And they, they work, um, they've been functioning for quite a while in the meanwhile, but also a place where we by accident just were earlier on today, could, could take another a nice co-housing project. Um, not so far from here, but um, there are in the meanwhile quite a few more co-housing projects uh, in Brussels. Now this is all very physical, so to speak. You could actually visit Côté Canal. Uh, it's a nice place. Um, and you could visit Biscope. But there's also, of course, a bigger disruptive development going on. Has been going on for quite a while as well already, which is called the platform economy, the gig economy. To well you could call it in many different ways, but the, the easiest way to give it a name is to refer to Uber, to Deliveroo, to Airbnb, whereby gig workers, often with very little social security or none at all, um, they are well uh, running gigs, as they say, yeah, so very short uh, jobs. But we have seen in the meanwhile that also there we uh, there is a sort of cooperative counterweight developing. It's still very young, very junior in a way, but we do see, for example, at Airbnb launching projects across uh, Europe. We see co-op cycle as a sort of counterweight to Deliveroo and uh, the, the uh, courier services. And you see in London, for example, the drivers cooperative whereby um, the drivers themselves are owners of the company that actually runs the, um, the, uh, the, the, the whole system to get a driver. We refer to these as platform cooperatives. I have a bright PhD student in Rotterdam working on this topic and looking at the development of these uh, platform cooperatives uh, over time. We do see that most of them actually are still in the beginning stage. Um, but uh, there's quite a bit of a development, although many of them, like Smart in Brussels is one of those, have been um, well facing quite a few challenges because of the pandemic. Uh, Smart, for example, is a platform cooperative for mainly artists and self-employed. Um, and of course, we all know that artists had a very tough time over the past year and a half. Another development I want to uh, show you, a last one, is that of a form of what we call a top cooperative. So all of the initiatives I've shown you so far are initiatives whereby natural persons, you, me, can become members, can become 
shareholders. You, put be, you buy a share, sometimes that can be 50 euros, but it can also be 2,000 euros, depends on the cooperative. You buy a share and you become a member and you get return on investment, so to speak. You, you buy a share and you get electricity or you get care when you need it. There's also a form of cooperative whereby not the natural person, but the legal person, an organization, it can be a city, can be a um, commercial company investing in tourism, for example, or it could be a farmer with a, his own farm, can become a member of a what we call an area cooperative. It's a fairly new development in the Netherlands, but it has grown quite rapidly, and there you see that it's used primarily to develop certain areas that have been well, not well uh, managed before, for example, uh, areas around train stations or rural areas whereby different partners are put together, a local government, a, um, a commercial provider of tourism services, a school sometimes, like a, a polytechnic or a department of university. They work together and they form a cooperative to develop that, that area. But they are not natural persons, there are organizations behind it. All of that, I think, we should also connect to a another development, not just disruptive economics, uh, as I just showed you, and uh, with Uber, etc., but also the growth of participatory democracy. In Brussels, a lot of people have invested in all sorts of new forms of participatory democracy, and it's not just in Brussels, it's all over Europe. And the Netherlands, they're also working, for example, with Right to Challenge. In Flanders, they're now also implementing that. Many different types of instruments are being experimented with, and I think it's, to a large extent, still experimenting with, because in many cases, um, it sounds good, and local or national governments think, oh, let's try that to get our citizens connected closer to our policy making and, and the execution of the policy, but often there's not much framework in which this fits. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds good. The right to challenge sounds good. Yeah? So I think we have to, um, I think it is really a need to, to, to make some order in a bit of the participa pa patient chaos I think there is currently. And it's also good to do so. I'm not going to go over this whole t uh, um, table, but I do want to show you where these initiatives that I was just talking about, these energy cooperatives, care cooperatives, etc., where they are situated. So you have the whole range of representation, uh, city councils, referenda, G1000, citizen budgeting, participatory budgeting, all these things, you know, all very interesting and very useful to reconnect to citizens and reconnect policy to citizens. Um, the right to challenge also fits there, but what we're talking about is actually more the right-hand side of this table, whereby local governments connect to citizens in sort of partnerships, for example, uh, local daycare, daycare centers set up in a cooperative form, but the infrastructure is provided by the local government, for example. That's a sort of partnership, or the local government, for example, becomes a shareholder in the local energy cooperative and thus helps deciding on where the energy cooperative moves to. But on the right hand side in the blue part, we see places where, yeah, I'll just say it a bit, just a moment. Um, we see a category of citizen collectivities that's actually functioning without involvement of the government. And most of the collectivities I've talked so about so far are actually of that kind. Most of them are rather independent from local governments. And in many cases these days, they also say, it's nice to have subsidies, but it, when it comes with conditions, we don't want it, we'll solve it in another way, and we, we want to stay independent. We don't, don't want to organize what the government asks, we want to organize what the citizens ask, what our members ask. And that's, in a way, a good thing, because people actually um, self-organize and come up with solutions. On the other hand, it's also a bit risky, because it might lead to a situation whereby the role of the government being making sure that the general public and the general, you know, the, 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 the general cause is taken care of is, well, is, is can no longer be, you can no longer control that. You can no longer have an influence on that. So it's a bit of a, an evolution that I is interesting to, to follow, but also maybe uh, something for governments to take care of that they don't lose a connection with these organizations. And basically, um, the subdivision that you see here, 
There's also one between citizen involvement in the public sense on the left hand side. So in the public goods provision, uh, parks, um, uh, making sure that playgrounds are organized, etc., and making sure that you are involved in organizing the playground, etc. And on the right hand side, it's really about private goods provision. So it is about energy uh, care. In some countries, it's still a sort of public provision, but sometimes it's being privatized, etc. So most of the initiatives I talk are really about private goods provision. So let's see what time it is. Okay, do I have half an hour? Okay. So let's take one step back. I've shown you a lot of examples, I think, some graphs, some, some very practical perspectives on what I think is happening between the market as a solution and the state as a solution. Yeah? So I think we can now say there is something going on, yeah? but what is really the bottom line of this? So what is really the, the, the gist of it, so to speak? Wha what are we really talking about when we're saying, okay, we're talking about institutions for collective action, and that is another governance model than the state and the market. What does it really look like? So I'm going to try to explain that to you in a very, very abstract way, uh, but then we're going to fill it again with um, uh, perspectives on, on, on the mechanisms behind it, etc. So basically, and a bit on the history as well, of course. Um, basically, it's a group of citizens that gets together that feels they have a specific need. And as I just said, it really is about very basic needs in life. Uh, energy, for example, who could do without electricity these days. Uh, mobility, uh, all sorts of transport, but also food, care, very basic needs. So citizens see, okay, we, we, we have a need and we don't want to have it provided via the government or the market, or in many cases, there is no provision. So we have to do it differently. And they have also often a sort of quality connected to it. It's, it's just not, not just any care, but care that's close to the people who need it, not anonymous care. It's not just any energy, it's renewable energy they want. Okay, And they form a collectivity of people, but important there, it's about members. You have to be a member of the group. And that's where you have the difference between open access and commons, institutions for collective action. It is about membership. It is, in fact, in that sense, you could call it an exclusive system. But of course, it's only so exclusive as you set the rules for membership. Yeah? On the other hand, you have a collectivity of resources. And here, the term ownership is, I could say, important, but actually it's not important. It's about resources you hold collectively. So the collectivity of members has ownership over the collectivity of the resources, but the rights of the members are not arranged via ownership, but via use right. Yeah, you have a right to use, but only as a group you have the ownership. So it's not like you get out of the collectivity, you, you stop being a member and you take part of the resources with you. Yeah? It's a bit more complicated than that. But what happens often when you have a group of people and a group a set of resources that you want to run uh, or use together, it's you get a social dilemma. People are struggling with the question, shall I choose for my personal short-term gain or shall I choose for the long-term collective gain? And basically that's the question that has been keeping us busy for a year and a half already as well. Shall I get vaccinated? Huh? and make sure that the, the, the whole society benefits. But maybe I have my doubts, maybe I don't want to get vaccinated, or so you think about yourself, but you think don't think about the community, things like that. So the, the social dilemma is everywhere. We have social dilemmas on a daily basis. But these social dilemmas that are being created here, because these people do choose to become a member of the group, so they, do, they choose to have a social dilemma, so to speak, they are really dilemmas within that group. Eh? So they are delimited by the group. Now what do you do when you want to so solve a social dilemma in a peaceful way? Then you come up with an institution and you come up with rules, you come up with values and norms that drive your institution. Yeah? And basically these three elements are the basic components of an institution for collective action. But the fact that they are collectivities of members and collectivities of resources that's rather important. Yeah? It's not a, a, an individual with a resource that sets up a rule. Most individuals won't do that for themselves. 
Now, what is probably more, even more vital is to understand what is on the overlays between these rounds. Yeah? Now, why are they in this composition to start with? Because what personally interests me, but luckily also other people in my research team, is to figure out what makes these organizations resilient. Resilient to external shocks, to, for example, a pandemic, but also economic crisis, anything, climate change, whatever. Eh? What, what makes them resilient? What makes them strong enough to deal with these changes? Yeah? Will, for example, uh, SMART, as I just said, a platform cooperative is dealing with the impact of the pandemic on its members. How can they survive this period of external pressure? How can they become resilient for it? And then you come to three mechanisms which are absolutely vital to, uh, to understand, to know what is an institution for collective action. We're talking about utility, about social equity, and about efficiency. Utility is more or less a starting point. You're not going to join an energy cooperative if you don't need energy, right? Most people will only join not because they um, because they simply want the revenue of joining an energy cooperative, but also because they need the energy. Yeah? So that's the utility. It has to be useful for them. On the other hand, people join that kind of organization because they want to have a say in what happens with the resources. That's where the social equity comes in. It's about being part of a decision-making process. Yeah? And it's uh, absolutely vital that you run your resources in such a way to the right rules, to the right values, that you run them efficiently. Because if you overuse your resources, if you give people too many resources per person, then of course there will be nothing left. And then you have what is called in the classic economic literature, I'm stressing classic, the tragedy of the commons. Yeah? I could say a lot about the tragedy of the commons, but I think literature is full of it. And it's also quite full of mistakes about commons. So we're not going to talk about that tonight. Um, but there's plenty of literature about it. Um, so I'm going to con continue on, on what really, um, where you can fill these, these, um, this, this model with, so to speak, because there you can also see that there's a huge variety, as I've shown you already, in energy cooperatives, there's a variety, but also in care cooperatives, but also in the types of members you can have. For example, uh, you can be an, a solely investor, but usually you're also a consumer. Uh, in many cases, these are organizations for pro what we call prosumers. They produce for themselves and consume what they produce. But you could also be, for example, a member of a, working co a worker cooperative. Eh? There's, for example, cleaning cooperatives in the Netherlands, whereby the workers are the shareholders of the cooperative, but also the, the, the workers themselves. Uh, you could also be a producer, in particular if you like, um, um, uh, have a company that's part of a cooperative. <laughs> So there's a so quite a bit of variety there. There's also quite a bit of variety in terms of the what we call archetypes of institutions for collective action, but I'm going to say a bit more about that later on. And there's also a huge variety in the types of resources you can find. It can be about food and a food cooperative, about care, but it can also be about combination of resources, so a sort of multi-purpose organization. And we know from historical studies that actually that makes organizations stronger if they have various forms of services and goods they offer to their collectivity, it makes them actually strong. Now, these types of institutional collective action, uh, as I just said, it's about the utility, primarily for the members they use, about the efficiency and about the uh, equity. But um, those are a lot of things to take into account when you become a member. So you must have a very good reason to become a member. And you can ask yourself, okay, if there is an offer by the market, why would you ever join a cooperative? Why would you ever even do the effort of setting one up, which is still quite, uh, quite complicated? There's actually quite a few good reasons to do so. In the first place, because you create a sort of economy of scale which you could not reach on your own. Uh, remember I showed you this map of the Netherlands where in places where there's actually not much uh, demand for, for example, elderly care, there are care cooperatives, but it's only because people joined their demands and created a sort of economy of scale that it became worthwhile to set up a care cooperative. It can also mean that you have to join resources. For example, there, there's nice examples of care cooperatives which in the same building, which was one of them I know in the north of the Netherlands in Klosterbuhl, which used to be 
owned by a commercial company, it was bought from them, and afterwards it housed elderly people from the village, but it also offered childcare, and there were some uh, 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 there were jobs for people with uh, disability. So they combined these resources in order to create an economy of scale, to create enough critical mass to make sure that they could actually run the organization. By doing that, they also have a sort of collective bargaining position towards, I write here, authorities, but in the Netherlands, for example, it's a collective bargaining position towards care providers. Uh, they can actually hire people at a better price, for example. It's also about sharing risks and resources. It's also about lower search and information costs. So if you work together, your access to information about specific uh, resources is actually easier. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment with the historical things. It reduces trans transaction costs because uh, you can have um, a system whereby you actually um, transfer your uh, shares, for example, from one generation to another. Would be a bit of a legal discussion, but it's uh, in here, but uh, there's interesting ways of reducing transaction costs within cooperatives. And of course, um, people also do it because they search for community or what you could call togetherness by means of creating new communities. Eh? For example, the members of the bread funds really do on the whole appreciate their the other members because they also get a sense of community from it, but also sometimes it leads to work. But as I just said, you also get so, uh, social dilemmas, so there might be some trouble once in a while. It's not so easy to get to reciprocal relationships between members. Uh, it's all about reciprocity. So I become a member of a group and I ex expect something back from the group without expecting something from a particular person, but still the group has to provide something. And um, there is a large variety in ways you can manage these, uh, these groups. So the question then still is, why would you set it up and why, why do we see these collectivities emerging in some periods and lesser in other periods. So there must be some sort of general driver behind that. Yeah? And I'll come back to that with a bit of a history lesson. And the question here is, what you see here is, is, a, is, is just, a, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but you see that in over history, in, in time, o over time, we've seen many different types of um, applications of this kind of model. We've seen many different archetypes of institutions for collective action over time. So all these resources I mentioned, these types of institutions, they all um, existed once in a while and actually evolved over time. But there's also some periods when this happened more than another time. So let's try to figure out when it happened and why it happened. And for the when, we first go back about a thousand years in history, um, which is quite a long time. And I'm a bit disappointed you can't see the, um, there's some yeah, arrows over there, but they are apparently invisible. Um, so there's actually a lot more on the screen than what you can actually see. But the background is a bit too light apparently. Um, but what you in fact see here is a development from the late medieval period, 11th, 12th century, of um, collectivities in the countryside whereby farmers work together and use land together in the form of what we call commons. And the term commons is probably for many of you, it does ring a bell. It has become a household name over the past 10 years, more or less, which has surprised me because I, I used to do my PhD in the, in the previous century already and nobody had ever heard about commons. But of course, it also helped that in 2009, Alan Rostrom got the Nobel Prize for that. So it's in a term that's been used for many types of institutional collective action by now. But we've seen those commons developing from the late 12th, 13th century onwards. We've also seen guilds. Maybe that term does ring a bell to m some of you. So artisanal guilds, but also merchant guilds. Artisanal guilds are um, uh, collaborations of artisan in particular occupations. For example, smiths who work together, but also people who make shoes who work together. And of course, every one of you has already visited the market here in Brussels, uh, wonderful the big market, I mean, where the city hall is. And if you look around, you will see the old um, guilds houses, which were actually the places where these people met. Sociability, meeting each other, is still today a very important um, yeah, function of these organizations, but it definitely was for the guild members. They 
met in these guild houses and they made new rules. They uh, decided on how to uh, treat their prices, for example. They had minimum prices, minimum wages uh, set. But also um, they decided on, for example, insurance for widows of former masters of guilds. Uh, they decided on insurance for um, fire. In those days, houses were built in wood, so sometimes you needed to rebuild a workshop. They had insurance for that. So all these, um, these functions were united in the artisanal guilds and for merchants and the merchant guilds. At the same time, we also see very nice examples, also one a little bit left in Brussels, in Beginiches. So there were communities of women um, in cities, uh, mainly in cities in the northwestern Europe, you see this in particular in northwestern Europe, you already see quite early on in time women uh, first working before they get married. And they often went to live together in a sort of semi religious context in Beginiches. And there's actually a still the uh, Beginage church here in Brussels, which was the center of the Beginage here in. Uh, Brussels, and in the Netherlands is another type of institutional collective action which is very important. That's the water board, so the the, the organization that kept the Dutch their feet dry uh, by making sure that everybody cleaned their canals, making sure that everybody did their duties, um, and in that sense secured a very important collective good, safety, yeah, and dry feet. Um, but what we see is that by the end of the 18th century, well, you should see it, you can see it on my screen. Um, maybe I should just turn it around. <coughs> For those with very good eyes, you can actually see it here. <laughs> um, so by the end of the 18th century, most of these um, types of institutions for collective action are abolished top down. So local. Local and national governments ga national governments are emerging in the 19th century. The, it's the birth of the nation state, so to speak. Um, they, well, they, d they develop uh, new laws, which actually to the abolishment of most of these um, f types of collectivities, except the water boards, but they were organized in a different way. They were more organized more hierarchically from that uh, day onwards. Now we also see that some of the functions they had were actually transferred to new types of oh, no, no. institution for collective action in the 19th century. So the first wave of these institutions is sort of late medieval period until the end of the 18th century. And the abolishment is really not just Dutch, it's also in Belgium. Um, they were abolished, but also elsewhere in Europe. Some areas like um, in uh, Austria, Switzerland, for example, you still have the, the commons, the agricultural commons that survived because if they would have abolished those, the whole um, pasture economy, so to speak, would have collapsed. So they didn't do that. But um, yeah, as you can see on that screen, um, in the 19th century, you have a new development amongst others of those mutuals I referred to in the beginning. So mutual insurances, but also cooperative banks. And I think most of you must have heard either of the Rabobank, you must have heard of the Rabobank, or Raiffeisen. Uh, Raiffeisen is actually the original name of cooperative banks, credit banks in Germany, but also in many other countries, for farmers who wanted to basically have a bank. And commercial banks were city banks in those times in the 19th century and did not trust the farmers, so they were not offering services to farmers. So farmers. Some of them did have money, so they have to go somewhere. And then Raiffeisen uh, in Germany started the first Raiffeisen banks, and then those developed into farmer loan banks in the Netherlands, and then those developed into the Rabobank later on. Um, the same goes for large dairy farms like Friesland Campina, etc. Now, all of those started as very small farms in the 19th century, and very many small farms. Yeah, but they merged into larger forms. And that's one of the big differences with the first wave. In the first wave of institutes for collective action, those guilds and commas, etc., they did not merge. They often didn't even talk to each other. Um, they worked on their own. And sometimes when they became too large, they split up. Because social control becomes more difficult when you become large, when you have a lot of members. So they split up and they specialized in specific occupations. Whereas in the case of the second wave, 1880, 1920, is sort of the height of that wave, you see that they don't split up, but they do the opposite, they merge. They become larger. So all these individual farmer loan banks, all these individual mutuals, they joined and became huge companies like the Rabobank 
or Fisal Campina, etc. It's also the time, by the way, that the trade unions pop up. Uh, and first, also, they were very small, but then they united. So, in contrast to the first period, it's a sort of merger strategy they follow. The downside of that, however, is that that um, social equity, wor what we were talking about, being able to um, take people along with you, members along with you in the decision-making process, it becomes much harder because you're a huge organization with a lot of, um, well, a lot of bureaucracy, with a lot of administration, etc. So that's a lot harder. Now, in the 20th and the 21st century, we've seen a new development. Um, I showed you the, the graph of the Netherlands. And actually, it's taking place in more or less all the sectors that we, um, we can think of. Maybe the least in typical sectors that are what sectors that are typical, um, typically run usually by governments, but in the meanwhile also often privatized, like mobility, uh, like um, the train sector, for example. So far, um, it hasn't been taken over by citizen collectivity yet, I think. Um, so often these are actually better run by governments because they are, are have a nationwide service, um, and uh, citizens they don't really set us up because it's usually a very local endeavor. Now, interesting in this case is that they don't have this merger strategy of the second wave, and they also don't have this split and strat uh, specialized strategy of the first wave. But there's yet another strategy, and we call that polycentricity. It's a network strategy whereby these organizations don't grow like the pharma loan banks of the second wave, but they stay small, they guard our identity. Remember I said about the bread funds in the beginning, so those small mutual insurances for self-employed, that they are actually, they have a limit of 50 members per, per unit, yeah? And they really stick to that. There's some bread funds that decide to go to 51, but not larger. There might be, must be very, very good reasons to go to 51. And it's basically because they want to go guard their identity, their local embeddedness, and um, the fact that they can use social control to make sure there's no free riding within the organization, or the least possible. So all these <laughs> initiatives and all these networks, basically, all these organizations have their own network per sector. Now the big challenge is to make sure that they also talk to each other from network to network. Yeah, okay. Um, so what can we take away from this very, very superficial um, historical comparison, a very large scale, but that's as good as I can do in uh, this time for a thousand years of history. Um, so basically, um, as I said, there's differences across time. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But what we, I, I promised you in the beginning that we were going to look at the history and uh, the evolution of it, also to figure out what's really behind these people setting up these rather difficult and time-consuming form of uh, organization. And if we look at the different periods in, in, in our history, we see that right before every of these waves of collectivities, early modern period, the beginning of the early modern period, the middle of the 19th century, and uh, 10, 20 years before the wave we've detected now, we see a period of liberalization of services, public services, and we see a high degree of commercialization. And in fact, the period when you see the first wave coming up is exactly after the period when there was a lot of urbanization in Western Europe. Of course, this was already, uh, the urbanization was already very well under the way in the 19th century, but in the late medieval, early mo er modern period, that really was a new development, the growth of cities. And of course, if you have a lot of stress on resources because more people are using them, there is, uh, th well, it's not of course, it's apparently that's the case. People see the need to start protecting these resources and start to sometimes creating other resources in order to make sure that they are actually having, they actually have access to these resources. So farmers in the late medieval, early modern period saw the effect of the commercialization of the cities on their demand for for dairy, for vegetables, etc. So extra stress on the local natural resources and they decided to organize it differently in a more efficient way to make sure that they could actually handle the demand and to make sure that their ecosystem was not overused. The, sit the, the um, craftsmen in the cities who then decided to set up craft guilds, 
they saw the impact of um, an increased um, involvement of people with w with no training, uh, le really wage laborers who worked for a lot less money, and they decided to set up their own system so that they could actually guard the quality but also maintain the level of their income. Similar situation happens with the labor unions in the 19th century. So you see that this stress leads to a sort of search for a new modus vivendi in this new situation. And basically, for example, in the, in, the in, in the recent wave, we've also seen that the system shows cracks not so long after the moment when this wave starts. So in that sense, maybe we can also consider these institutions as a sort of canaries in the coal mine, that they say, okay, something's going wrong in certain sectors. We want as citizens to offer an alternative. And we have to be sure that, um, well, that we, we, we do so because we see the cracks in the system, but the cracks, of course, can also become larger. Now, um, some other things we have uh, not stressed yet, but here and there we have. Of course, about these waves of collective action, and when they, they end, and as I said, they, they uh, changed. Um, oh, this is useless. Um <laughs> They changed quite a bit. Now, I wanted to say a bit more about housing, but I'm looking at the time. How much uh, time can I still take? This is not very visible for you guys. It was a very nice picture, though. Yeah, I'll go through it very, very rapidly. It's a very nice picture, um, a taxonomy drawn up by a colleague from Delft, I think at Chiska, uh, Chiska who's um, working on a collaborative housing project. And I would really like to refer to her work because definitely for a city like Brussels, if you want to do a case study or something like that, here it's uh, definitely interesting to look at uh, the work done on collaborative housing in recent days, it's one publication. But you see that the variety is huge uh, also today. I mean, I've tried to put the variety in the past thousand years in three slides, but if for today it would be even harder, I guess. There's a huge variety in types of institution for collective action. I already showed you that there's a broad spectrum, but, well, yeah. But what is interesting about housing is that um, whereas originally a lot of co-housing projects started because people saw an opportunity, there was a large building, empty, some people thought, okay, we want to do this with a number of families because we think that's a more qualitative way of living. It wasn't always cheaper than buying a house. But these days, those that perspective, the position from people building um, or engaging in a co-housing project has moved from, as it used to be, an opportunity to basically um, a situation by wha whereby you, you do it because you see no alternative. Eh? Basically an opportunity because out of a lack of choice, so to speak. But that again delivers a broad variety of types of um, collaborative housing projects. Uh, just some examples, for example, here a nice example in the Netherlands, Ecuador Buco is a sort of Ecuadorp is a, a way of, well, basically another way of living where, which is really multi-purpose but also multi-generational. But you also have single generation collaborative housing projects which are really more servant oriented, uh, like the Abbeyfield project, which is actually in Flanders quite popular. And there's also now an interesting example, not just in Belgium, but this is uh, an example which is thriving quite well uh, in Belgium right now, whereby the cooperative can also be a way to offer other people housing. Uh, Wonkop, for example, is an example of a co cooperative whereby you, th their motto is, I think, renting from yourself, whereby you become a member of the cooperative and you can get a, a cheaper price in terms of uh, rent when you live in the house of the cooperative. But as an external, you can also invest in the cooperative and give away your advantage to people who go and live there. So it's also a possibility to, um, for example, support grandchildren or um, yeah, support other initiatives that are taking uh, some space in these uh, cooperatives. But it's still, uh, this is also a way to um, get profit. It's not a social cooperative, it's a cooperative which makes profit if things go well. Another nice example is one set up not so long ago whereby you have a combination of people with a disability who uh, are living together with people who help them without a disability, uh, care co-housing. Um, so uh, there's a lot of variety there and I think it, it when it comes down to co-housing, 
it, it's endless, uh, the types of um, possibilities you have there. But as I said, and I already explained this, I think um, there's also a lot of variety over time uh, in types of strategies that are being followed by the movement as a whole. There's also a lot of variety in time, in the earlier times, in comparison to today, um, in terms of the lifespan of these organizations. Actually, um, if you look at the early modern period, most of these guilds and commas, etc., they survived for hundreds of years. And today, we're actually talking for about organizations that sometimes only exist for a few years. So it's really possibly the beginning of a new wave, but we don't really know yet what it's going to be. Uh, and in comparison to their historical antecedents, they still have quite a big job ahead of them, I guess, to become that. And also, what we also see is that individuals, so the natural persons who become members of these organizations, their membership is also considerably shorter over time. So even though these could be solutions for the challenges that society societies currently face, or partly solutions at least, I'm not saying that everything in a society should be organized in this way, and we need to strive, I think, towards institutional diversity rather than the scarcity and solutions we have right now. But even then, um, it will also ask commitment of the people who set it up in order to make sure that these organizations survive and that they stay members and don't run off right away when things are going wrong. Now just to, oh yeah, there's one thing, one important issue here too. When before I, I take you to the, the very final slide, which I hope will also raise some discussion among you and the average age is here of those who are basically the future. So I really hope we can talk about values in a moment. But what is really essential, I think, as a starting point for many of these organizations and also to understand the values behind the principles on which this, these organizations build is that there's a lot of variety, as I showed you, in, in, the, in the whole spectrum of these, this type of institutions. But there's also a lot of variety within these organizations in terms of uh, what I could call the reciprocity cycle. So what you bring and what you take to these organizations. There can be a huge variety from, for example, an energy cooperative whereby you become a member on day one and on day two you get electricity. And if you pay your bill at the end of the month, you still get electricity. So basically the reciprocity is the time window between bringing and taking from the collectivity is very small close to immediate, whereas, for example, in the case of the bread funds, the reciprocity can be non-existent even, in the sense that I bring to the collectivity so that others who get sick take, but ideally I never get sick, right? Ideally I'm not a day without work, so I don't need the bread fund. So there the time window can be, well, non-existent, eternal, so to speak. And that is really something very difficult to, to basically also realize among members of collectivities. But it's also difficult because um, it also shows you that the values uh, underlying these uh, different forms of institutions can, well, can demand, can, can, be, can need to be stronger in some cases than others. For example, in energy cooperatives, I think many members will not really consider that as a form of solidarity. You don't really need that much solidarity to make an energy cooperative run. Why? Because there's technology that basically regulates the solidarity. You get in, you get energy, you don't pay the bill, you don't get energy, right? That's sort of what technology does. It doesn't work like that in the bread fund. If you don't show your solidarity towards others, then, um, well, you will have a problem within the group. So solidarity is, is, is also very, well, I mean, it can be, you can need a lot of it and you can need very little of it, but it is a fu fundamental element in getting that social equity going. Yeah? Making sure that people understand why and sometimes they, um, they will not get as much at that point as others. Yeah? The other element, maybe the, the starting point of everything is that reciprocity. You bring and you take, but um, those are really connected to each other. Yeah? That's also why it's, a, it's a, a membership system. So you want to make sure that you can identify people who bring and who can then take. And maybe the most essential value for future challenges is the right one. 
that's behind efficiency, and that's sufficiency. So sufficiency is basically a position you take in. Efficiency is something you can calculate. It's a, a principle. But saying you have sufficient is, is a norm. Yeah? It's a value that you choose to live up to or not. And I find it quite striking that within many of these uh, collectivities, sufficiency is actually something that is taken for granted. So you're a member of a uh, community-supported agriculture system and you don't take more than what you need as a household. You don't take more as what you need from energy than what you really, you don't take more than what you really need. And in some cases, this also leads to the situation that what could be commercialized is not commercialized, but is um, uh, reinvested in the society. Now, sometimes energy is sold, but the benefits of that, though the profit that is made is invested in local, local types of, um, of, of services, you know, local swimming pool to the local sports field, whatever. So um, making profit is basically not the central driver behind these systems. It's providing uh, resources to a sufficient level, to a level that everybody can uh, live with. And it's not a, I don't think it's a sign of poverty, it's rather a sign of good resource management. And I think I'm going to leave it with that. I think my time is up and I hope you have some questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Tina. I think maybe it's easiest if you take questions yourself so you can kind of regulate a little bit. Um, I think maybe there's one microphone. Um, maybe it's best that you get behind that microphone as well and then I'll run around and uh, yeah, uh, offer the microphone to people. Okay. So please raise your hand. Hello, good evening. Thank you, first of all, for the lovely talk. Um, my question is, um, if I look at, let's say, demonstrations these days, on many of the posters you read something about system change. Are cooperatives part of a system change, or are they more of a workaround to deal with the current system, as in like maybe even cementing the current system? question indeed. Thank you. Um, no, very nice one. Um, also to elaborate a bit more on that part. Um, I think they're in a way both. Um, depending a bit on, on what kind of legal format a cooperative demands, and uh, that's different in every country in Europe, um, you get the freedom to reorganize your resource management as a group. Yeah? Um, you can choose, for example, to really um, go against the system and, for example, uh, make sure that what you could earn on what you, uh, uh, you know, what you produce in energy, for example, that that goes back to the society. Uh, there's ways to organize that via asset locks, via rules internally, etc. So basically, that you really decide not to make any profit on that. Um, there's also ways to simply, indeed, use it as an economic form that's close to a company but then run by many people. Yeah. So it's really how people organize it internally that can make a difference, yeah? On the other hand, and there's, there's two ways, uh, t there's a macro um, diversion on this question and a micro one. From the macro perspective, I just told you in the beginning as well that if you look at what happened in Germany, and whereby the, contrib the contribution of renewable energy to the, to the, the whole of um, energy production in Germany at some point was was massive. And the, the, the production that came from the, in the energy uh, communities was, was massive and really changed the system. So it can change the system even if you're not a huge player because the small players can have an impact on the system. Yeah. So that from the macro perspective, I think it can change. And for example, in the Netherlands, all these small bread funds, they put pressure on the system but also um, these care cooperatives, for example, they constantly challenge the large care providers. Um, they really run discussions as well, and that's because they, they use this network strategy. So that's what happens when you have all these smaller ones together. 
on the micro perspective, I think it can also have an impact on how people behave within society. It's one of the things we would like to study in the future, to what extent being member of a democratically run cooperative, you don't have to do it democratically, but in many cases that's the goal of these organizations, also have an imp has an impact on, on the behavior of people outside of their of the organization. Uh, for example, to what extent being a member of a worker cooperative leads to more pro-social behavior outside of the organization. There's some scientific evidence uh, on both a positive and a negative outcome of that. There's some uh, scientific evidence, but it's very li limited, that shows that when people are, for example, member of a worker cooperative, they do engage more in local politics, they engage more in community efforts uh, it's a, as such, so they do help to change the rest of society, but there's also evidence that shows that it's not the case that they're actually sick and tired of meetings during their work, so they don't really want to go to more meetings after their work, um, which is understandable as well. So we, we don't really know yet to what extent, at least from a scientific perspective, that can make a difference. But um, I, I think it's quite hopeful to see that so many people who are uh, engaging in these organizations also decide to change other parts of their lives and reconsider how they deal with uh, scarce resources. But as I say, it's not all evidence-based yet. Or maybe it won't be, but we'll see. Thank you. Yeah. There's another question here. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the lecture. It was really interesting. Um, one question. Um, I was expecting you to say something about community land trusts, and uh, we haven't heard. So is there a particular reason for that? No, not particularly. No, actually, that wasn't one of my, my other uh, talks. But uh, I know Brussels is very active in terms of community land trust. Um, I think it's it's potentially one of one of the ways to um, to secure um, the use of, of public space, or well, you, you then actually guard that part of, this, of the land you own as a city as public space. But I of, often see it also as something that's really not understood by the people who join in. In a way, it's actually going back to a much older system, which in some, for example, Dutch cities like Amsterdam is still very much in place, where you actually lease the land from the local government and you put your house on it. So the only property you have is not the land, but the building on it, right? I, to, it, it is a solution to some extent, but it's still a, a, a temporary um, way of, um, it, it's a way to, to guard the property, but not necessarily to improve the building on the, on, the, on the land, right? So if it's in combination with, for example, more efficient housing, uh, more efficient of, of the use of the land, I think it's a solution. But if it's just a way to keep the land in ownership of the city, I don't think it's necessarily a solution. Also, I mean, you, you, you let people build on the, on the land for decennia. So if you decide to um, use it in a, in, in a not very efficient way, then it's also for decennia that that is the case. So yes and no. But it's, it's, I think the answer to it must be nuanced. Other questions? Yes, again, thank you for a super interesting lecture. I was wondering, would you say that um, academic work incorporated to the growth of, um, of collectives and, and cooperatives you mentioned, especially about the third wave, and if so, what would you say is the role of academic work to kind of like still be objective about, as you said, like the, these collectives can have like minuses and pluses, but then how to still keep the objectivity of the researcher and like support them through academic work? Well, anybody of you who had a basic course in statistics knows that Variety is actually a good way to understand causality and to understand uh, how, how things actually work. And that's also, I think, what we should do as academics. Look at the variety of this type of organization. Eh? Look at um, how this develops in different sectors, um, in different uh, circumstances, and try to understand how it really works. It doesn't always work. Things go wrong. So I don't think, as academics, we should say that, you know, this is a solution for everything. To start with, not on a macro level, it's not the solution for everything. I don't think, personally, that the... Uh, 
national train sy system should turn into a cooperative. I think we've also seen proof, and then actually in, in the UK they've actually come back from it, that it's not a good si way to privatize it either. So that there's other solutions to that. There's, I think uh, the government has to play a huge role in managing the train system. Yeah. So you don't have to, um, you don't have to put every resource we need into a collectivity like this. So that's not the solution. And in between that, in that whole spectrum of solutions, it types varieties of this governance model. You also see some systems that work better in some sectors and others that work less in the sector. So I think the main role we as academics need to play here is to figure out what is really the driver behind a good functioning collectivity and what does it, when does it really contribute to society and to really uh, you know, offering solutions to, to the big challenges ahead of us. Um, I think we can play a very important role in that as academics, also by engaging with these collectivities and trying to, I wouldn't say advise them, because it's often necessary to just simple f simply figure it out as a, as a collectivity, uh, but um, to really um, you know, support them with evidence-based knowledge. Um, there's actually, in the Netherlands, a lot of researchers doing research on this. A lot of it is about energy cooperatives. I would personally like to see more people working on other sectors because, as I explained earlier on, it's actually, uh, you know, in terms of internal corporations, the energy sector is not that super interesting to look at because you become a member of an energy cooperative and, you know, if you pay the bill, you're a good member. In many of these other sectors, it takes a lot more to be a good member. So I would really like to see people also studying other sectors than the energy sector. Of course, it's very important, it's it booming, it's very necessary, but um, there's other sectors that tell us more about what it takes to be a good uh, cooperative member, yeah? And what, it, what the conditions are to stimulate people to contribute um, to this kind of collectivities. So I think, yeah, there's plenty of research to be done and there's no need to be subjective. Um, I think there's a, it, it's clearly that this is something that's developing in society, and I'm very much pro of figuring out um, what is actually happening in society and what, what really drives these collectivities, both in you know, the context, what's, what's changing in the context that drives them, um, and what makes them function. I think that's a, a could be an interesting contribution we can do as uh, researchers. Is that a good answer for you as a researcher? <laughs> okay, there's another question. Thank you very much. Um, at the start of your talk, you spoke about um, these cooperatives or collectives as sort of filling the gap where the state hasn't acted or the market has failed. Um, often the third sector charities, NGOs are seen as sort of plugging that gap. How do you, how would you compare these two actors and how can they sort of sit alongside each other? Um, well, in many cases it's, it's not really, it's not always possible for the NGOs, etc., to pick this up, but there's also some, th this is really fundamentally different from charity as such. Um, I know in some countries like the UK there's sometimes a bit of an overlap um, but I think, um, you know, the, the type of collectivity that I showed on the, the right-hand side of that table is really independent um, and thus also has to um, be self-sufficient. And people can be charitable once and, and contribute to a collectivity, but they usually also expect something in return. So it's not going to build on charity. I think it's it, the mechanisms, the drivers behind this are are really also quite different. That doesn't mean that NGOs, for example, can't play an important role in helping to uh, to set up such uh, organizations or or even be a partner in an organization like that. That happens too. I mean, there's uh, sometimes NGOs that um, stimulate their members to become part of uh, cooperatives. There's also cases whereby, for example, cooperatives give part of their revenues to uh, specific NGOs. So it's not like they're two separate worlds, but in terms of incentive structures behind it, I think it's quite different. It's it, you, as a citizen, I think you you have different motivations to donate to an NGO than to be part. It's not donate, be part of a cooperative. 
Any other questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, do you have a view on who the public is that participates? Is it m mostly higher middle class or also vul vulnerable groups in, in the cities? Um, well, there's part of the, as I just showed, there's part of the groups that we don't see. Uh, we, we don't identify yet as part of this bigger movement. I think it would be really nice if that we do that more in the future. Uh, for example, within these, uh, these roscas, uh, these rotating mechanisms, uh, um, systems, they, those are often quite vulnerable groups that see it as their way to not having to go to the banks huh, to loan money. In other cases, um, um, especially when they are in the pioneering phase in the sense that it's a sector where nothing, nothing much has happened yet, not many collectivities have been set up, it is often, um, first of all, highly educated uh, people with some money to spare that invest in it. Um, but once these systems are sort of established, you do see change in that. For example, in the bread funds, it's, it's, it's very different. Also, years ago, we did a study on the political, motiv you know, the political background of people joining in, a, in um, such a bread fund, and it was also extremely varied, you know, from liberal, left, whatever, you know. So people don't really joined there because of an ideological reason, but because of a utilitarian reason. They, they need a system to replace that, um, well, what, what the government was previously offered. Um, I think that, that in many cases, it takes, a t it takes a while before people actually join. It also takes some, some knowledge to, um, before you can actually, um, for example, organize your 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 system, your shareholder system. It sounds like this, these are people that are going to the to the stock markets or something, but that's not the case. These are shares, parts of a cooperative you can buy. It's possible to define them as very small uh, shares. Uh, people chip in twenty euros, for example. It can be a share. It depends on how you define as as a cooperative and whether you have an eye for uh, people who can not afford uh, to to invest a lot. Uh, what the, the, the good side of it is that usually in most cooperatives um, it's not those who have a large amount of shares that have the, the biggest say. It's a one person, a one shareholder, one person vote you have and that kind of system. So that makes it internally in terms of democracy usually more equal. Yeah? Um, there's also development for example in energy cooperatives whereby it's not simply about producing energy which of course is highly capital, uh, it's, a, it's a real capital uh, intensive thing to do. I mean, setting up a windmill is extremely costly, but where you first of all invest in saving energy. And basically that's also what we primarily need. First save energy before you start thinking, where shall we put the windmill? Huh? Um, there's also ways to um, support people who are not capable of, for example, insulating their house through an energy cooperative. There's one in Ghent that actually uh, has a system like that. So you don't necessarily have to, um, as a cooperative, you don't have to focus on, 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 on uh, resources that only demand capital. You can also organize it, for example, in, in terms of energy saving and then reach other parts of society than what you would do when you only try to attract capital. All the questions? There was somebody over here. All right. Oh, I didn't spot it, sorry. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you. A lo uh, thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering that uh, certain groups might also be less um, inclined to form, like groups of less dominant cultures maybe, might be less inclined to join an existing cooperative or form their own because they don't trust the people who've uh, formed it or they don't have the time to do it or they like um, don't like the administrative burden that's connected to it. So I was wondering, have you heard of any initiatives that basically facilitate the yeah fun the yeah the fun foundation moment mm -hmm. you know of uh, of uh, other collective actions like automize the process in a way? There's a lot of um, both consultancy organizations supporting people in setting up their cooperatives, but also um, non-profit organizations um, that are 
helping out uh, starting initiatives. But as for example, also in the Netherlands, I know of a very nice uh, an interesting example of an, um, a cooperative formed by refugees to make sure that they actually have access to labor markets. So it, it, it's, it's um, I think because there's already quite a lot of examples, it's not so hard anymore to start with. Uh, there's a lot of support mechanisms. Not so much, for example, yet in Belgium because the growth is, is but there's, there's also organizations here where you can get information. So I think it's, it's fairly accessible. But I think the whole story really starts by, um, by naming those initiatives that really fit under the same umbrella and, and saying, okay, this is not just something that happens among uh, people who were born here, but it can also be imported from other continents, uh, like the examples I showed. It can also be uh, seen through those glasses, and those are also interesting examples to, to, to study, for example. So uh, it's one thing to, uh, to stimulate that it everybody can have access to the means to set it up, but it's another thing to also see where it happens and not just see the usual suspects, but also look uh, beyond that. I think that's very important. Maybe a final question? Um, I was wondering if uh, all cooperatives are in general more uh, uh, greener and or have a green approach uh, or and if they are like um, in generally could they be a solution to climate change or could they counter these major problems uh, which are not yet fully approached by governments um, yeah. well I, i'm coming back to the example of germany where this has taken place uh, where they they did force um, new legislation on um, on renewable energy in this case I personally don't know of cooperatives recently set up that were not striving towards renewable energy. So um, if, it, if they're being set up, they do have this very clearly on the agenda. Um, but it also depends a bit on the legal context again. Uh, we Years ago, we did a bit of a comparative study between Belgium and the Netherlands. And what was really interesting there to see is that um, in the Netherlands, the possibility to uh, to set up a windmill, etc., is is it's far more, it, it's it, you know the, the 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 access to land to do so, etc., is is far easier than, for example, in Belgium, which is for to a large extent monopolized uh, uh, by one big player in the energy sector. Um, the Netherlands, they're far more you know uh, used to see windmills in the in the landscape as well, although there is protests uh, often as well. Um, so what we've seen there is there's a lot of smaller communities across the Netherlands, uh, but in total, their number of members is not particularly larger than, for example, in Belgium, where you have a, a number of larger energy cooperatives. And that really has to do with the, um, the political climate to some extent. Well, also the, the situation, oh, do you have one big player um, and you better unite to make sure that you stand strong against this one big player and make sure you can secure some ground to put on these uh, windmills? Or do you have a system with a lot of commercial players and you're just one of the many and you can simply, well, simply, it's not that simple, but you can think of setting up a uh, windmill in your local village. So it, it really depends very much on how that is organized. Now in Germany, we've seen that they popped up all over the country some of them actually went very far in, in really making uh, making a sort of a local energy system that was closed. Um, and in that sense, I think you do set examples and you you do also the in, you, you support the innovation, the experiment experimental phase of um, coming up with solutions for, in this case, the energy part of the climate change problem. Um, and in that sense, also stimulate the market to change. I think that is a, an often overlooked side effect of this development that the market is also tickled to come up with newer solutions because there's so much experimentation going on. In some cases, the market actually takes over these collectivities. Uh, for example, in the, the fiberglass sector in the Netherlands, um, people were experimenting with new ways of putting fiberglass everywhere, and then the market came and just simply bought everything, sometimes even with support of uh, governments, um, which is uh, and a total, uh, complete uh, 
um, other evolution of when you've done all these uh, efforts to set up a cooperative. But I think um, it it can be a good stimulus to 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 uh, you know come up with new solutions and and new ways of um, um, also making people aware of renewable energy. Uh, it also depends a bit on the local climate, how fast that's going. In the Netherlands, for example, the share of renewable energy is still fairly small. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement still. And then there's a final, final question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies for that. That's okay. Um, I heard you just mention that collective action can uh, trigger the market to change. Um, how do you think collective action could also trigger the governments to change rather than just being this canary in the coal mine you just mentioned, but also to uh, re-emphasize that governments do have responsibilities in providing all these services from which they've retreated in the last 30 years? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, they can, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I should uh, be optimistic about this or not, because for example, in the case of um, the insurance for self-employed, you've seen this really, uh, I mean, they take up a historical example of basically what, what were the predecessors of the welfare state. So it's a bit ironic in a way that these, these mutualist systems are now re-emerging um, after the retru retreat of the government in some domains of the welfare state, so to speak. So the historical examples are set up again. The logic thing now might be that the government responds again and uh, puts the older system in place. But so far, I don't always see that happening. In this particular case, it doesn't happen. Um, what is also interesting to know is that in a survey we did a, a while ago, a few years ago, um, we asked pe members of these bread funds whether they would actually um, leave the bread fund if there was an alternative. And a lot of them actually really appreciated not just the, the, the access to the um, collective funds they, they had that way, but also all the other resources and services they had access to uh, through the collectivity. So it's not because the government would take over again that, they, that these uh, organizations fall apart unless they are forbidden or something like that. Um, which happened in the 18th, early 19th century. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a chance that uh, governments respond, but in, in most of the domains, I haven't seen it happening yet. Um, you do see some, on, on a local government basis, you see uh, often alliances uh, with, for example, an energy cooperative, um, which can also mobilize citizens to invest, for example, in local energy production, but also make them more willing to accept, for example, that there is going to be a windmill in their vicinity. Uh, so it's, it, it's often a better way also to, to um, organize, in this case, renewable energy. But also in the case of care cooperatives, um, if of course, if you, like in, in, in Belgium, we haven't seen them emerging that massively yet, except for a few like care, co-care houses, etc., for people with disabilities, etc. But apart from that, not much not, nothing much happened. But in the meanwhile, we do see a progressive privatization of care also in Belgium taking place. So I'm not sure what the tipping point will be. Uh, will there be at some point more of these organizations popping up because they say, okay, the the you know, I don't I don't accept this anymore? Or do we have to go to the complete privatization of care before it happens? I'm not sure. Um, in the Netherlands, it hasn't really led to profound change of the situation in terms of, you know, the care system as yet. Thank you very much. I think we have to conclude here. Thanks, uh, Professor de Moor. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and thanks also to you, the audience, for your questions and the people at home watching the live stream. Next week, we'll continue the series with a talk by uh, Brett Christophers from Uppsala University. He'll be talking about not decentralized ownership or management of resources, but uh, you could say the epitome of concentrated ownership of, uh, of real estate. He will be talking about Blackstone, which is a kind of a major Wall Street firm uh, owning a lot of property in a lot of cities uh, across the globe. Now, next week will be fully hybrid in the sense that our speaker
due to COVID cannot make it uh, to Belgium, but we'll have a, a hybrid setup. Uh, there will be a live stream uh, with Brett speaking and this there will be an audience here, uh, or at least we hope so. There will be options for Q&A uh, with you in the room. So please join us next week over here, and then we'll have a, a splendid time again. Thanks again, Professor De Moor, for your talk.